We are honored and privileged this morning to have Pastor Bill Thornton with us this morning, doubly blessed. First of all, I'm not preaching. <laughs> Second of all, hey, thank you. Hey, all right. Second of all, he was a teacher for Alex. So if you want any dirt on Alex, stick around afterwards and ask Brother Bill. Brother Bill, will you come and lay for us what God has laid upon your heart? Good morning. morning. It's great to be with you today. Uh, Before I tell you just a little bit more about myself, let's read our scripture together. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 50. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning with verse 50. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this Lord's Day morning in which we are able to come together here as a part of your people here on earth to express our praise, our love, our adoration for you, and in the presence of one another to remind each other of these important truths upon which our lives are built, our hope is found, the very purpose and meaning of life that you have entrusted to us, to give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Would you bless our time together now with your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, my name is Bill. Some of you had an opportunity to meet me before the service, but for all of you, uh, it's so great to be here. When Alex asked me uh, if I would be willing to come and share with you, uh, of course, I was very excited to accept that invitation. Uh, I've known Alex for several years now. Uh, For many years, I still, I actually live in Lincoln, Nebraska. For 30 years, I pastored a church called Capital City Christian Church in Lincoln. But for the last seven years, I've been a teacher, a professor at Nebraska Christian College in Papillion. And it is there that I met your pastor, Alex Wolf, when he was a student, a preaching student. And... um, over the course of our time together, he had actually, he actually arrived on campus before I began my teaching. So we were not, I think we were together for a couple of years, but we had a number of opportunities uh, to be in class together. By the way, this isn't counting toward my preaching time, I hope, because this is just like warm-up time. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's how preachers sneak extra time in on you, you know, they do stuff like that. Uh, I have lots of wonderful memories of Alex. I do remember one class in which (laughs) there were only two students in the class, and Alex was one of them. It was right after lunch, and one of the the other student in the class was an older gentleman. His name was John. I won't tell you his last name in case you might know him, but (laughs) anyway, John had this thing that, well, as an old man, I understand this. I get this. It happens to me, too. At lunch, after you have your lunch, a lot of times it's nap time for older people, (laughs) And uh, sure enough, about 10 or 15 minutes into my lecture, he would, he would be gone. 
And so it ended up being mainly a class with just me and Alex one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, he was a good sport. And uh, I, have a, I have a high regard for him. And uh, he's, I'm, I'm very proud of him. And I know that he is dearly loved here in this congregation. You encouraged him during an internship, as I recall. And following seminary, now he's back and able to be your pastor. So I anticipate that God's going to do great things through this partnership, this relationship uh, in the days ahead. This morning, I want, to, I want to talk about giving ourselves fully to the work of the Lord for our labor in the Lord, Paul says, is not in vain. The passage of Scripture that I read this morning is a passage of Scripture that I'm sure I've read hundreds of times. Probably uh, the most frequent occasion for a reading of a Scripture like that would be a funeral service or at the graveside during uh, the committal service. I think this is one of the most important passages of Scripture. In fact, I would say 1 Corinthians 15 is one of the most important chapters in all the Bible. At the very beginning, toward the beginning of chapter 15, Paul says in verse 3, for, I, for what I received, and he's saying this to the Corinthian church, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. I had a teacher many years ago. His name was Dr. Van Buren. And I remember sitting in a class called Christian Doctrine where Dr. Van Buren made this statement. He said something like this. I'm paraphrasing because after 40-some years, my, the, the memory as we've already heard testimony to, uh, can sometimes not be what it once was. But I recall him saying something like this. While all Scripture is true, not all Scripture is of equal importance, of equal clarity. And I think if we've studied, spent any time with the Bible at all, we'd have to acknowledge that what Dr. Van Buren said is true that there are some portions of the Bible that are difficult to understand, and honestly, there are some portions of the Bible that we may even wonder, I wonder how that got into the Bible. I don't exactly understand the significance of that. But let us also say this morning that what we're going to talk about today does not fall into either of those categories. Paul says it is of first importance. This is the core, the foundation upon which we live our lives, upon which our hope is built as Christians. That Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again, and because of what Paul says about Christ's resurrection in chapter 15, and our own resurrection also in chapter 15, he says this to the church in Corinth, give yourselves fully to the work of of the Lord, for you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So this morning we're going to talk about, very quickly, how we do that. How do we as individual Christians and as a body of believers, a collection together in this congregation, how do we do that in the 21st century? And we're going to listen to Paul, his ancient wisdom that directly follows this powerful statement that he makes in chapter 15. Give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You may be aware that the chapter headings and the verse markings that we have in our Bibles today were not there in the original letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. And so it is the chapter 15 and this great challenge to live out our faith in a meaningful and powerful way just flows naturally into some practical suggestions that he gave to the church then that I think are very helpful for our consideration today. In fact, I would say 
that if we together as believers would aspire to these things that I'm about to talk about, then we will find our lives of faith quite meaningful, our hope realized as we live for Christ. However, if we ignore these things, it is to our peril as a church. In fact, I would submit to you today, I can say this because you don't know me, I'm a stranger to you right now, that when churches ignore these things, this is when they get into trouble. This is when they kind of drift from their purpose and become something that Jesus did not have in mind for his church. And so let's talk about the how to that, of that, que that question, how to give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. The first suggestion I'd like to make, I'm going to make three today. The first one is this, be generous. Be generous. In chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, Paul says this, now about the collection for the Lord's people. He's talking about the offering. Notice how he has talked about the resurrection of the Lord and their coming resurrection as believers. And he says, give yourselves fully to the work. And then he says, now, about the collection about the offering. These are not like additional nice thoughts, like a P.S. at the end of the letter. No, he is telling the Corinthians, and he's telling us today, how to give ourselves fully to this work. Now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Paul is talking about being generous, that our generosity should be more than occasional, that it should be periodic. In fact, he says on the first day of every week, that our generosity should be personal, individual. Each one of us has something to offer, he says, each one should set aside a sum of money, that it should be proportional, that not all of us have been blessed in the same way. And so Paul says, in keeping with our income, we ought to be generous. And of course, generosity can come in all kinds of ways. Paul is speaking here of finances, what we might call our treasure, but when we think of things like our time, which is precious to us, and the talents that God has entrusted to us, all of these are things that have been, we've been blessed with for the purpose of being generous, to show the world around us a God who loves to give. And when we are able to marshal these things together, as a church, like for example, a number of individuals such as are on the missions trip, you know, leaving this morning as I understand, you know, for a time, a missions trip together, you know, those individuals being united together in a common purpose to bring encouragement, to bring help, to bring the love of God in a generous sort of way, that's an example of what I think Paul is talking about, that if we're going to give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord, the place to begin is in being generous and recognizing, God, everything I have has been entrusted to me by you, your spirit. I don't own anything. It all belongs to you. You have access to it. And so I don't know if you're like me, but it's taken me a long time to begin to understand this lesson in life. By nature, I'm a stingy person. By nature, I like to think about me, myself, and I before I think about anybody else. And so I am grateful for little reminders like this in God's Word that remind us to be generous. That's the first one. Second one, be flexible. To be flexible, we're going to skip down to verse 5 in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 where Paul goes on to say, after I go through Macedonia, 
I will come to you. He's giving the church at Corinth his traveling plans. He says, I'll come to you, for I'll be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you for a while or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. Now, before we talk about Paul's planning, I want you to notice with me, right there at the end, in verse 9, how he talks about how I want to stay in Ephesus for a while until Pentecost because a great door for effective work has opened to me. And how do I know it's a great opportunity? There are many who oppose me. I love the spirit of the Apostle Paul. We need more of this kind of spirit in the church that says the bigger the challenge, the better the opportunity. You know, how often it is when we bump up against any kind of resistance at all, how quickly we can become timid and back away. Not the Apostle Paul. No, he knew that so much was at stake that even facing opposition, he gave himself fully to the work of the Lord. Now, notice two things about the intentionality of Paul, his planning for the work of the Lord, his work for the Lord. There is a place for planning in our work together as a congregation. Paul made plans. We make plans. There's nothing wrong with planning. However, Paul also remembered that God has a plan that supersedes every human plan. And that is where I get in trouble sometimes. I forget that. Perhaps we all can fall into that trap of thinking that our plan is better than God's plan. I love what Proverbs 19.21 reminds us of. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Let me give you an example from my own life of, of how I've found this to be true and how God is teaching me to be more flexible. Uh, our son Mark, who is in his 30s now, but when he was a high school student, felt God calling him to be a, a minister, to go into the ministry. And as a pastor, you can imagine how I felt about that. I was so pleased, so excited that Mark sensed that God was calling him in this way. In fact, I couldn't help myself. I even envisioned in the future, maybe God will allow us to serve God together in some way in terms of ministry. And of course, in every one of these imaginary scenarios that I had in my mind, I was the leader. Mark was the helper. I mean, I'm the older, wiser, more experienced, he may have had me on looks, but otherwise, uh, I mean, it just made perfect sense to me. That was my plan. Well, today, we are engaged in ministry together. We're involved with a nonprofit ministry in downtown Lincoln, as well as doing some work in Haiti as well, called Jacob's Well. But here's the thing. He's the one who founded that ministry. He is the one who has the vision from God for that ministry. He is the leader of our ministry, and his dad is one of the helpers. And if you look at how God has wired us, how he's equipped us, how he's prepared us for ministry together in this kind of fashion, it is apparent that God's plan is vastly superior to my plan. We need to learn to be generous and to be flexible with God and with one another. And then thirdly, to be kind. To be kind. Verses 10 and 11, Paul says, When Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing 
to fear while he was with you. For he is carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. No one then should treat him with contempt. Send him on his way in peace so that he may return to me. I am expecting him along with the brothers. Now from what we know of Paul's protege, Timothy, he was a young man who struggled with confidence. To be sure, he seems to have struggled with being a little bit timid when around other people. Now, this is not the worst personality or character flaw in the world, but it definitely can get in the way when you are constantly thinking, am I, am I measuring up? Am I able to do it? When the focus is on our own insecurity, on our own inability to do what God wants us to do. So Paul gives instructions to the church in Corinth to be kind to this young man. And we would do well to do the same thing in our relationships with one another in the church. Because here's the thing, we all have personality quirks. We all have shortcomings in our character. Not a single one of us in this room is perfect. In fact, some of us have had negative life experiences that have left profound wounds that we are still in the process of healing. I'm thinking about our Old Testament reading this morning. Naaman, perfect example of this. A man of some uh, consequence, some ability but he was struck down with this debilitating disease known as leprosy. And so through a, the course of some interesting circumstances, he finds himself in the presence of the prophet of God, Elisha, and Elisha tells him what he needs to do in order to be cleansed. And he's like, no, are you kidding me? Aren't there rivers back in my country that are better than your rivers? You know, we read that and we think, wow, didn't he realize what a gift he was being given? But of course, we all know that old adage that hurting people hurt people, that oftentimes when people are feeling this way, that in response to well-intentioned offers, for help, that they will push away, that they will want to drive people away with their words, with their attitude, with their action, sometimes their physical presence, even conveying a sense of, leave me alone in my misery. You know, when I encounter somebody like this, I try to remember, it is a daily struggle, by the way, I have to keep reminding myself that when people present themselves that way, there is often a contributing reason why. And instead of lashing back at them, as we sometimes feel like doing, or defending ourselves, as we're often prone to do, I think we would do well in the church to be a community where people, all kinds of people, are listened to and understood, and valued, and gently shown that there is a better way to live our lives and to deal with our hurts, but we have to be kind to one another. To be generous, Paul says, to be flexible, and to be kind to one another. And then he summarizes his thoughts by saying this, verses 13 and 14. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. How should we live as believers today in the 21st century, how should we function as a congregation in our world today in light of our resurrection hope in Jesus? Paul has told us what we must do. We must be generous. We must be flexible. We ought to be kind 
as we give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because brothers and sisters, let us remember that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen.